Okay, so I'm hoping that you can now see my screen. It should say supporting students with depression. Um, if there's an issue, please somebody hop on their microphone and let me know. So my name is Adrienne Lavoie. I'm a registered psychologist with Chinook's Edge School Division. I'm new this year. Um, so we may not have met yet, but hopefully that would happen soon, um, perhaps as early as this fall. And I think to start off this topic, I'm, I'm just going to talk about um, some of the diagnoses out there. So the most common diagnosis is major depressive disorder, but there are quite a few other diagnoses out there that have depressed mood or uh, can be described as low mood as part of their symptoms. So bipolar disorder, dysthymia, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, substance or medication induced depressive disorder, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, adjustment disorder and bereavement induced depression. All of those diagnoses also um, have low mood as one of their features. So just a few things about some of them. Disruptive mood dysregulation disorder is actually a new diagnosis in the last couple of years. And my understanding is the reason it was created um, was because bipolar disorder in children was being overdiagnosed. So you can have a child who has bipolar disorder, but um, there is another category now to consider, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Um, dysthymia is very similar to major depressive disorder, except that typically the symptoms last longer, but aren't as severe. Um, it is also known as persistent depressive disorder or PDD, you might've heard of that one. Um, bereavement induced depression. Sometimes I get questions around, isn't bereavement normal? And yes, a grief process is normal. Bereavement induced depression are for those who um, grief is going on longer than would be expected or has become quite severe and has started to interfere with functioning. Um, and then adjustment disorder, it's a group of symptoms. Uh, it can be something like stress, feeling sad, hopeless. There can also be physical symptoms. And usually you would get that diagnosis if um, you've recently had a stressful event in your life and you are just struggling to adapt, struggling to manage it. And the struggle is considerably more significant than what would be expected. Okay, next slide talks about comorbidity. So comorbidity is basically talking about when you have two or more chronic conditions uh, happening at the same time in one person. So unfortunately, with depression, it's more likely to have um, multiple diagnoses than to have only depression. Um, and it's not to say that one causes the other, though sometimes you might have one that's more predominant or might uh, show up first. And as you might imagine, um, a lot of these conditions can interact and can make treatment and recovery a little bit trickier. So if you have depression, you're more likely to also have panic disorder, conduct disorder, or autism, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Eating disorders are more common. Anxiety, those two are often seen together. Obsessive compulsive disorder, learning disabilities, social difficulties, and substance use disorder. Oh, um, the other thing maybe I'll mention is that I tried to include a few visuals, a few sayings on the sides of my slides, um, just to provoke thought and um, get people thinking a little bit more about what it's like to have depression or a mental health illness. So they're just there for you to consider if you wish. So I thought I would share a few statistics and facts. Three to 8% of children aged three to 17 qualify for a diagnosis of depression. That's a, a North American statistic. And uh, the range from three to 8%, I think tries to account for the fact that there are quite a few uh, children out there who have depression, but go undiagnosed because people are just not aware that that is the issue. 
2% of preschool kindergarten age children qualify for a diagnosis of depression. So it is definitely um, more rare for younger children to have depression. Teenage girls have almost twice the rates of depression as teenage boys. And in childhood, there appears to be a slightly higher rate of depression in boys than in girls. This one is up for debate. Some people would say it's about the same. Or I should say some researchers would say it's about the same. Uh, and then 60% of children who take medication for depression show that they improve. And according to research, the most effective treatment for depression includes a combination of medication, therapy, and education. The education piece comes into play, especially for children, um, <clears throat> when a lot of their progress and recovery is dependent on their family and how much their family buys into uh, whatever the treatment plan is. And so the education piece is not just for uh, the person who has depression, but it's also for the family. And then suicide is the third leading cause of death in young people in the world ages 10 to 24 years of age. A statistic out of Canada, which is a little bit similar, is um, youth age 15 to 24 years of age. It is the second leading cause of death after car accidents. And then a little bit more hopeful statistic, suicide rates in Canada are going down. Uh, this is on a per capita basis, which basically means that if you were to see the number of suicide, suicides from year to year, the number may stay the same um, or may even appear to be going up. But when you account for our increase in population, it's actually going down. So that's good news. Hopefully it continues. And then just a few other statistics that I don't have the, on the slide. Uh, young people age 15 to 24 are more likely to experience mental health illness or substance use disorders than any other age group. So they are quite vulnerable. Mental illness is the leading cause of disability in Canada. So when they gather statistics and information on people when they apply for disabilities, whether it's through um, education or their, their jobs, it appears that mental illness is um, the top reason. Um, and then this one, maybe it's obvious, but it's a good one to put out there. Depression is correlated with poor academic grades and also correlated with um, decreased rates of graduation from high school, unfortunately. Okay, I'm just going to quickly check in with the, the chat bar to make sure that there's no issues and check to see if there's any comments. Looks like we're all good, so I will keep going. Okay, next slide, moving into potential causes. So there's no one clear answer for what causes depression or mental illness for that matter. Um, there are a few theories though, and I thought maybe I would share one as an example. There's a theory called the diathesis stress model. And basically what it says is that we um, have, or some people have a predisposition for depression. So they have a, a genetic loading for it. And then in combination with that, um, people experience a stressful event. And the two of those working together can create depressive symptoms. So, for example, if you had identical twins and one had depression and one did not, um, they would both have the genetics, the genetic loading for it, but potentially one has experienced um, a difficult situation, something stressful that has, has turned on the gene. So some things that show up in research to be connected with um, depression are factors like physical health, mental health, life events, biochemical imbalance in the brain, family history of depression. So how many other people um, in the family have had depression or mental illness, the environment in which we live in and we grow up in, and then mentioning genetics again. So some specific scenarios or examples to help us to just understand what it might look like. Um, here's some, some life events or factors that could play into depression. Poverty and financial difficulties, especially if they're chronic. Exposure to violence. Social 
isolation and and perhaps you might think about what we're experiencing now with uh, this pandemic um, i think that people some people respond really well to um, all the rules and regulations that are in place and they don't mind it whereas others people are quite stressed by this um, parental conflict and exposure to that on a chronic basis poor nutrition illness um, <clears throat> medication and injury and pain So in terms of explaining symptoms, um, there's, there's quite a few layers to it. And I read an article where they divided the symptoms up into categories. And so I, I liked that approach and I tried to, um, to do it here. So I've divided symptoms into cognitive symptoms, emotional symptoms, behavioral symptoms, and physiological symptoms. And then try to further break it down into what it might look like in the classroom. <clears throat> so um, the first one I've got here is cognitive symptoms. So somebody might have memory problems, concentration problems, attention problems, negative view of self, world, and the future, difficulties making decisions, feeling a loss of control, and suicidal thoughts. So how that might play out in the classroom, you might see poor work completion, giving up on tasks more easily, forgetting assignments altogether, uh, doubting their ability to complete work without help, arriving late or not arriving at all, um, lacking organizational skills, everything just seems to be a mess. And then also assignments can be disorganized and messy. So they lack flow and organization. Um, a person might have difficulty following the lesson, keeping up with the pace. Um, they might be distracted struggling to pay attention, um, difficulty expressing their ideas and opinions, whether it's written or verbalizing them. And then you might see that their academic performance goes up and down. There's quite a, a range. And then talking with others about wanting to die, drawing pictures about death and dying, posting on social media their thoughts about dying. So another thing that makes identifying depression particularly tricky is that if you're experiencing depression, you are likely having negative thinking patterns, which might look like um, believing that nobody cares about you, that nothing can help, um, and there's no use reaching out. And so um, if you're not reaching out and you're not believing that there's hope, you're less likely to get help. The other piece um, is often students lack the ability to talk about it. They don't have the language um, to explain to somebody what's going on, or they lack the self-awareness to know that their experience is not okay, that it's unhealthy, and that um, there is hope, and that there is potentially a name for it, and things that can be done. Um, and then finally, the symptoms tend to be more quiet or more internalized, um, especially when you compare it to some of the other problems you might see that students experience in a class. Um, depression symptoms are quite quiet. Um, so things like changes in mood, being sad, that's not something you're going to um, see right away. Changes in sleep aren't as obvious at school. Um, and then just some of the other um, symptoms of depression, like the executive functioning. It's, it's really difficult to pick up on those quickly. Okay, so the next category I've got here is emotional symptoms. So examples are separation anxiety from caregivers, especially for the younger kiddos, low self-esteem, low self-worth, being irritable or angry, um, numbness or apathy, so just not having a lot of emotional expression, uncooperative, a lack of interest in previously enjoyed activities. So they, they don't seem to care about um, the hobbies that they had before. Being increasingly sensitive to rejection. So sometimes they see rejection when others do not, or they seem to blow small rejections out of proportion. Having a negative outlook, feeling a loss of control, sad mood, feelings of hopelessness, feelings of guilt. 
So at school, you might see a student um, who cries often, who makes a lot of self-deprecating comments about themselves, pessimistic remarks in general, um, defying authority figures, even those that they respect and have relationship with, being argumentative, um, struggling to connect with their peers, and so being more withdrawn, um, sulking, acting generally out of character, and rejecting others. So you might have noticed that um, some of these symptoms are quite contradictory. You can have a kiddo who is really irritable or angry, or you can have somebody who doesn't have any emotional expression whatsoever. So I think it's just important to note that um, everybody's profile of depression can look quite different and that you don't need to have all of these symptoms in order to be diagnosed with depression. Um, and everybody, everybody is going to look different. Um, the other thing you might have noticed about some of these is that they may look like they come from other disorders. And <clears throat> there can be quite a bit of overlap between depression and anxiety or um, depression and uh, obsessive compulsive disorder or uh, mood dysregulation disorder. So it can be very tricky to tease out what is what and also just keeping in mind that it could be that they're actually having a combination of issues. It's not just depression that you're seeing. Um, the other thing to maybe note is that as school staff, you're not expected to diagnose, of course. I think the hope is that school staff will be able to recognize when something is wrong and be able to notify parents um, and get the right professionals involved so that somebody can do a little bit of assessment and diagnosis. And so a question I often get is, how do I tell the difference between normal ups and downs and mental illness? So some important things to consider is duration. So how long has it been going on? Um, and the longer, the more uh, concerning. The other thing to consider is how many aspects of their life does it seem to be interfering with? So if it's interfering with their ability to socialize as well as their ability to get to school or to perform well at school, that, um, that's multiple areas of functioning. Or if um, it has affected how much they eat um, or their self-care, those are also concerning, especially if they are combined with other areas. And then another flag to consider is safety. So if they're talking about hurting themselves, so whether it's self-injury or they're talking about suicide, you really don't need another flag for that one. That's just immediately um, getting that student help. Um, and then I think I mentioned this before, but just how many different symptoms are they showing? So the more symptoms, of course, the more concerning. Okay, I'm just gonna pause again and check in with comments and questions. I don't think I see any more. Let me just refresh my chat bar. Looks good. I will return to the presentation. Okay, moving on to behavioral symptoms. So this might include outbursts, uh, unwilling to participate, limited effort, suicide attempts. So you might hear that they've had attempt in their history, um, self-harm, taking unnecessary risks, having low energy, always being tired, a deterioration in self-care, inappropriate responses to events. So they might take interest in um, maybe a local homicide or perhaps something else that's tragic on the news and have a lot of questions about it. Um, isolation from family and friends and giving away possessions. That one's always concerning. So in the classroom, that might look like seeing them that they're more prone to accidents and injuries. Um, they're really disheveled. They're not clean. Perhaps they smell bad. Um, they work a lot slower. Perhaps you've heard that they are starting to use or misuse substances, um, sexual promiscuity, 
Hospitalization, again, you might hear about that being a part of um, their history. Cuts, burns, attempts to hide self-injury, taking an interest in grief or death, and peers reporting that the individual is withdrawn, or sometimes you'll hear about peers reporting social media things that they're posting that are disturbing or dark. Okay, next group of symptoms, physiological symptoms. Psychomotor agitation or retardation. So this is kind of a spectrum. The agitation piece, you might see somebody who's really fidgety um, or irritable, can't sit still. Whereas the, um, the other end of the spectrum is really slow motor movement, really slow to talk and speak. Um, and they also appear to process things really slowly. Another thing is somatic complaints. So they might complain of headaches, stomach aches, other aches and pains, changes in eating. So that can be either a big increase in eating or a decrease. Same with sleep. Um, you can see a student who sleeps too much or more than is typical or sleeps not enough and low energy. So in the classroom, you might, um, you might see a decrease in their rate of speech and motor movement. Again, difficulties holding still, being fidget fidgety and irritable, speaking laboriously. So that um, just goes again with the slow motor movement. They just really struggle to put their thoughts into words. Um, absences from school or being late, changes in weight and falling asleep in class. So you might have also noticed that quite a few of these symptoms are related to executive functioning. So things like paying attention, being organized, uh, planning and prioritizing, starting a task and then being able to uh, follow through with it until it's done, um, understanding different points of view, being able to regulate their emotions and understand where their emotions are coming from. Um, and just sort of keeping track of their own thoughts and feelings and activities. What's also interesting is that executive functioning is a concern that comes up with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, comes up with autism, um, anxiety, students who have a trauma history. Um, and so if you're worried about a kiddo and you're not aware of a diagnosis, um, but it appears that something is going on that's mental health related, um, it's a pretty safe bet that making accommodations for executive functioning will assist them. Um, it's kind of a, a go-to strategy when you're not sure what's going on with that kiddo. Okay, moving on. Next slide. Other explanations for depressive symptoms. So when a person is going to a clinician for a potential diagnosis, a good clinician will look at depression as a diagnosis of exclusion. So what that means is there's lots of other explanations for depressive symptoms besides depression. And so there's quite a few things to rule out. And I thought it might be helpful to name some of the more common ones, um, because I think sometimes people always assume that depressive symptoms is depression when in fact it could be other things. So um, you're probably aware of some of these already. Medication can have uh, side effects of depressive symptoms. Anemia is when you are low in iron and I've actually experienced this one myself. When it's significantly low it can alter your mood. Concussion or head injury can have um, quite a few mental health symptoms um, and those symptoms can last unfortunately for the long term but typically anywhere from one one year for the majority to up to three years uh, epilepsy which is a seizure related disorder diabetes especially if the diabetes is unrecognized and unmedicated you can have fluctuations in mood electrolyte imbalance pain especially chronic pain um, Wilson's disease, substance withdrawal, and thyroid issues. So if you have a, an overactive thyroid, um, you can be quite irritable and anxious, or um, an underactive thyroid, 
uh, looks looks more like depression, um, being sad, being slow, um, or apathetic. Um, however, there is medication out there for thyroid issues in particular that can really help with that. Okay. Next slide, mental health stigma. So I thought rather than just talking about depression for this one, it makes sense to talk about mental illness. Um, stigma is basically where people have inaccurate thoughts and, and assumptions about a group of people, in this case, a group of people who have mental illness. Um, and I think that there's been a lot of work done recently through social media, um, celebrities have also worked hard on this and a lot of companies um, have had uh, promotions and special days out there to bring awareness to stigma. I think one of the best ways to combat stigma is to bring it out into the open and talk about it. So I listed some of the, the common stigmas that you might have heard um, out there. And so maybe as I go through them, just think about whether you've heard these before um, and whether you've heard them from people who work with children or are in the service industry and work with and work with others. So mental illness is just an excuse for poor behavior. Bad parenting causes mental illness. Children can't be depressed. They're too young to have anything to be sad about. People with mental illness cannot be trusted. People with mental illness are weak and cannot handle stress. People with mental illness never get better. Mental illness will not affect me. People with mental illness cannot work. Mental illness is a part of aging. As we get older, we will all eventually be, be depressed. I know some of those are pretty startling, but um, there are a few there that I have, I have heard. And so the question of is mental, mental health um, stigma still a problem? So I did a little bit of research and found some statistics. The first one here is from 2008, so it's over 10 years old. And it says 46% of Canadians thought people use the term mental illness as an excuse for bad behavior or um, for missing work. And then 27% said that they would be fearful of being around someone or working with someone who suffers from serious mental illness. So then fast forward to 2016, I found a few statistics out of Ontario. 39% of Ontario workers indicated that they would not tell their managers if they were experiencing a mental health problem. And 40% of respondents to this survey agreed that they had experienced um, anxiety of depression or depression at a serious level and did not seek medical help for fear of judgment from family and friends. So although there is a lot of work to be done, um, I think that it is getting better. So I thought I'd just bring some attention to it today for us to consider. Okay, so moving into some classroom strategies. Maybe I'll just quickly check in with the chat bar again. Doesn't look like there's anything else there, so I'll keep going. So likely you are familiar with a lot of these, and so hopefully it's just a reminder of the good things we're already doing. Um, regular coaching and support with organizing their work and their workspaces and assisting with upkeeping an agenda. Um, these are executive functioning supports, and I think they are go-tos for students who are struggling with mood disorders, depression. Um, making accommodations for medication side effects and mood fluctuations. So if you know that they're on medication, um, hopefully the family is willing to share what the side effects are, and you might even start to see a pattern within the day. So knowing that that kiddo needs a break at a certain time um, or has a difficult time at this time of the day and so shouldn't be doing their most difficult subject, for example. Providing flexible deadlines, that is another um, suggestion for supporting executive functioning. Um, Maintaining a communication system with home so that both parents and staff are aware of progress, attendance challenges, and celebrations. Um, students with depression will often try to avoid and procrastinate. Um, they just don't want to confront what's in front of them at times. 
Um, and they're also not incapable of being manipulative. Um, students with mental illness are still capable of trying to pull the rug over our eyes. And so this is just basically an accountability system to try to keep them accountable and on track so that um, they don't fall further behind and potentially feel uh, worse about their situation. Carefully selecting peers for group work, seating plans, other activities to facilitate socialization in a supportive environment, helping them to connect with peers. So oftentimes there are uh, peers that are more understanding um, and more accommodating of students who have these kinds of struggles. So it's just considering that without, I guess, using the same students over and over again and wearing them out as well. Um, Depression can be a very isolating experience. And so uh, typically socialization goes down. And so students need a lot of support and encouragement to continue socializing um, so that the gap doesn't continue to widen. And then when you offer them praise using specific examples, so they're more likely to um, repeat that behavior or that thing again. Um, I guess the other reason why I bring it up is just being aware of how much you're praising versus how much you're critiquing them. When you have a student who's not engaged with school schoolwork, it's very hard to find things to give them compliments about. Um, and so just intentionally trying to make sure that there is at least as much praise as critique. Few more ideas to consider. Confronting the topic of suicide whenever the student brings it up. So if they bring it up, don't shy away from it. Um, and if you don't feel comfortable talking about it uh, with them, making sure that they get to somebody who can. If they talk about wanting to die quite regularly, they need a plan um, that staff are aware of, that guardian is aware of and hopefully um, they have other outside agencies involved. So doctors, therapists who have also um, been part of this plan. Don't be afraid to ask how they're feeling. Sometimes you don't wanna ask because you know that the answer is going to be negative, but I think continuing to ask has a message that you care. Um, and when you don't ask that also sends its own message. And then just being compassionate and curious without having strong judgmental reactions, which I know can be difficult sometimes. And then avoiding negative te techniques whenever possible. So techniques like uh, punishment, for example. Consequences, punishment is effective, but it tends to be more effective in the short term. Um, and when you can use positive re reinforcement, like reward systems or token economies, they tend to be um, more successful with all students, not just those who have mood disorders. Uh, removing barriers to family school wellness. So if they are connected with family school wellness, making sure that they get to their appointments, if they're in gym, helping them um, to get to family school wellness so their appointment isn't missed, for example. Um, I've also seen how telling the, um, the caregivers, the parents, that they have family school wellness appointments can sometimes increase attendance because the student has connected with them and wants to come to school so they don't miss the appointment. Trying to validate their emotions but not their unhealthy behavior, this, this can be tricky as well. Um, so an example might be if a student says to you that they're going to spend the weekend um, chain smoking, for example, and your quick response, you want to say, oh my gosh, that's terrible. We need to come up with something else for you to do to cope um, with how you're doing. And so sometimes it's more effective to say something like, sounds like you're really struggling. I'm sorry that you're feeling um, bad about this. Um, and just summarizing what you're seeing in them in terms of their emotion. Being cautious about always pointing out the positive, and I'm not saying you shouldn't point out the positive, just being aware that um, when a student is feeling low and depressed and they don't have a lot of hope for the future and the people around them seem to have a lot of hope, um, the gap kind of widens and they feel more isolated and even more misunderstood um, and that they're alone in their experience, if that makes sense.
So another thing you can do as an alternative is letting them know that their inner experience is valid, um, that it's respected and that it's acknowledged, even if it tends to be um, negative. Okay, I hope that made sense. Just moving into some resources or things to consider. The first article there, what the research says about different interventions. Um, it's an article that tries to look at all the different interventions that are out there for depression and give a summary of what the research says about how effective it is. So whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy or narrative therapy um, or exercise, yoga, mindfulness, they'll try to present some research on whether it works or not for depression. Self-injury, there's two articles there. The first website talks about self-injury and provides some resources. Um, the second one is the Canadian Mental Health Association and it addresses mental illness, but it also talks about self-injury and tries to explain it to an audience who doesn't understand why somebody might self-injure and how they can go about supporting that person without isolating them further. The next website is the Can We Talk website, which is a partnership between the Alberta Teachers Association and the Canadian Mental Health Association. There's some good stuff on there. And then Mood Gym, you may have heard of it. It is an interactive self-help experience online. Um, it's been really popular actually. And as a result, it used to be free. And I, I believe now that there is a fee of $39 to partake in it. Um, they also used to present it for anybody. And I think they've now said there's a suggested age limit of 16 years or older on it. Okay, I'm just going to quickly check in with comments again. There's one here. Do you have any suggestions how we determine how hard to push a student? This is difficult because sometimes we do feel like students are game playing to avoid work, but at the same time, we don't want to be the one to push the student too hard in the event that they are not. Um, yes, this one is really hard and I don't have a straight answer for you. Um, I think some factors can, to consider is the people who have strong relationships with those students tend to know them better and tend to know uh, when they are being a bit manipulative. And I think they also have the trust um, with that student to be able to say, hey, come on, we both know that you are capable of this. And let's go have a five minute break and then let's get down to business so that this doesn't come up for us later, for example. Um, Another thing to consider is if the student is at all interested in getting better or is aware that they are struggling with mental illness, um, it's a little bit easier to push them because it's really on them to, to get better and to improve. So you can kind of uh, shift the responsibility to, you know, I know this is hard and you don't want to do it right now, but this will get you further along the track of getting better. And um, it'll be a step in the right direction in terms of fighting your demons. Um, if the student doesn't see or have the awareness that they are struggling, um, especially if a diagnosis is new, you'll often see parents um, and children trying to, to cushion um, and give them lots of accommodations and give them lots of second chances and lots of breaks. And I would say that that is actually okay in the beginning but it, when it becomes a chronic problem and they're always defaulting to, it's not my fault, I have this mental illness or I can't help it, I am this way, um, it gets trickier. And so I would say that you're going to have less success when you don't have the buy-in of the student and the parents. So sorry, that's a really long answer and it's not a straightforward answer either. And it's because you bring up a really, a really valid struggle it's a really hard thing to decide how hard to push. Um, and I would say that it's recovery is rocky. And so you will have days that feels like there was no progress. It might even feel like you've moved backwards. And then other days where there seems like there's big jumps and that is considered okay and normal. Um, there's another comment here. People just appreciating the quotes. Great, I'm glad. Okay, back to presentation.
I have I have one more screen here, one more slide of resources. Um, the first one is an old commercial that tries to highlight mental health stigma. Man hit by car for mental illness. Um, and so it just tries to highlight how we treat physical illness and physical pain different from mental illness sometimes and how we maybe need to um, reduce that gap. The Virtual Hope Kit, this is an article on building a toolbox of things, reminders, letters, uh, comforting sensory tools perhaps that helps a person when they are struggling uh, with life, questioning life, um, feeling depressed, for example. I have built this toolkit with a number of high school students, um, and I think you could do it with younger kids as well. And then the core story of brain development, you may have watched this, it's a pretty popular video, and it just talks about how uh, brain develop happens and how there are so many factors that go into a growing brain. Um, and I think that after watching it, you can understand how, um, whether it's genetics or life experience or a traumatic event can contribute to depressive symptoms. And then here are the references uh, to some articles that I use to create this presentation. So if you are interested in looking a little deeper into depression, you can access my articles here. The first one is actually a reference to the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders, uh, the DSM. Um, it's basically all the recognized mental illness um, and mental disorders according to North America. When I first got my copy of this, a uh, professor said to me, now that you have this tool, you need to be very careful that you don't start diagnosing all of your family and yourself. So I will pass on that same um, consideration to you if you're, if you're interested in looking at that very thick uh, manual. Okay, that is my last slide. So I will just check in with questions again. I did indeed finish early, so please, if you have any wonderings that you want me to speak about, feel free to post them. Sorry, everyone, that was my phone. Um, I don't see on any other questions. I'll hang out for a bit in case some questions come up. Um, if you're moving on with your day, thank you for... Um, I was going to say for coming here, but I'll say for joining me in this virtual platform and I hope the rest of the week goes well.